Well, as far as I can tell, I'm live and I'm on Facebook. <laughs> as you can tell by the dress, I am indeed Malcolm Tent at P.O. Box 3626 Newtown, Connecticut 06470. And I can, straight, I can say now confidently that against all odds, I'm here and welcome to this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. It's been quite a struggle, kids, but I'm here. I made it. It's um, almost the perfect storm of new camera technology and the fact that I recently switched my internet service. So I figure, all right, what's changed? All I've done was switched an internet provider. That's all I've done. How complex can something like plugging into a camera and going live possibly be? How difficult can it be? All I did was switch my internet service. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, I, Malcolm Tent on Tent Talks Tunes, I'm here to testify that it makes things exponentially more difficult. So I've spent the last 20 minutes or so trying to figure out how to plug the camera into my computer so that the internet will read it. That's it. That's why I'm running late. I'm a Gen Xer. I don't know anything about this stuff. What can I tell you? I need a millennial around here to do these things, to help me walk through these tasks, these seemingly simple tasks. Ugh. I think I'm here. I'm going to reach over. I'm going to get this really awkward camera angle where I lean right into the camera because this is me going onto my sit-down computer, which is in front of me which I use as a monitor just to make sure that I am indeed going out live and uh, the people are seeing me and ah uh, yes it is happening the smarmy comments are coming in Bob Eaton says I should ask Harry for help good advice thank you for that Bob I'm sure Harry would be happy to help except he's outside stalking in the woods right now Shortly before I went on, as I was wrestling with this first slug in her thing, I heard what sounded suspiciously like a deer going through my yard. You know, it's getting dark earlier, so the deer are coming out earlier. And I'm um, pretty sure I heard a deer going through the yard, and I swear to God, Harry's hair just stood up. And he jumped to his window, the one that he goes inside and outside with. And he crouched down and he stuck his head out that window and he was like so attentive. His tail was switching back and forth the way a cat's tail does when they're on the prowl. And then he jumped out of there and ran off after whatever it was. So Harry apparently right now is a deer stalker. He's chasing down a deer. And um, if his habits with deer are anything like his habits are with mice and chipmunks and squirrels, he will most likely be jumping in the window with a dead deer between his fangs, and he will deposit it lovingly outside of my bedroom door, as he tends to do. He's a wonderful guy, Harry. He's always looking out for his hapless yet happy Harry human here. Me, Malcolm Tent. Yeah, it's been nothing but adventure around here. I'm going to readjust the angle here a little bit. That's one thing I can do with this newfangled camera. I can actually do things like zoom in and change the focus and change the frame. It, it is kind of cool, I have to admit it. And once I finally get this shite mastered, it's going to be groovy. It'll be worth drinking to, I promise. Yeah, we got all kinds of stuff, man. All kinds of stuff going on. Not only am I uh, dealing with my cat going out chasing deer <clears throat> and my computer not cooperating with my camera. My car is in the shop. Uh, another one of the long running jokes in my life besides technological difficulties is my car being in the shop. My beloved 2008 Sub uh, has an engine that completely seized up and ceased running. That happened last week. And my favorite mechanic is so backed up that the car has been there now for over a week and he hasn't even looked at it yet. So, what that means is that as I, the rock star record mogul and king of mail order, have mail orders to go out, what do I do? 
I get on my bicycle and I pedal the four miles from my front door to the post office in beautiful Newtown, Connecticut. And I don't mind doing it. I enjoy it. It's good exercise. It's a very, very nice ride. Lots of hills and dales and valleys and twists and turns and curves. It's very scenic. Um, I like my guys at the post office. We're all good pals. But the thing is, when I'm driving, it's about a 30-minute round trip to drive to the post office, take care of my business, and drive back. On my bike, it's closer to an hour and a half. So there's this ripple effect where everything just kind of runs, runs a little bit later and um, everything gets messed up. But it's all right. I'm here. I'm now. You're here. John Adam, anti-scene fan number one, says Connecticut is a beautiful state. It is true. It is true. I know John Adam was living here for a little while and Connecticut is a beautiful state. That's why I live here. Y'all know, I'm sure that I'm an expatriate Floridian, but I adopted Connecticut as my home almost exactly 36 years ago. In fact, we're coming up um, in just a few days on the 36th anniversary of the establishment of my brick and mortar record store, Trash American Style. 36 years ago, we opened up on November 29th, 1986. And my business partner, Kathy, and I made the trip up north on October 20th, 1986. So we are right here in the middle of a, a sort of historical time for yours truly. This, this period of time, mid-autumn, getting into early winter, is a very crucial, very crucial set of events. So I always get a little bit nostalgic and a little bit wistful around this, this time of year, late November. And uh, let's drink a toast to finding a place that works and staying there for the rest of your life. Cheers, cheers. Ah, let's see who else is on right here. Mike Lesser from Vancouver is watching. Hello, Mike. And of course, we mentioned Bob from Brookfield, Connecticut. And of course, James Pogo suggesting that Tent Talks Tofurky. You better believe it, man. I got my stuffed tofurky cutlets thawing out even as we speak. I love that synthetic lunch meat. I love that fake, fake Thanksgiving cheer. It really warms the cockles of my heart. Vegan power. Tent Talks Tunes. Vegan mofo. All right, let's just get down to um, the brass tacks, shall we? We've got some items to talk about, some show and tell. First, of course, you know, we've got the bulletin board. The bulletin board, as you can see, is kind of empty. There's really nothing on it because I was so horn swoggled trying to get the damn camera set up that I just didn't have time to put up my decor. But I will mention, of course, December 10th, the Punk Rock Flea Market, which is occurring in New Haven, Connecticut, at an indoor venue called the State House. I intend to go loaded for bear, as I always do to these things. I got tons of records and tapes and CDs that I will be sitting behind a table and peddling to you, the educated consumer. So if you guys have any want lists, if you're going to show up in person at the Punk Rock Holiday Flea, let me know. I have several thousand albums, several thousand CDs, and quite a few dang cassettes in my inventory. And um, a lot of it is listed, not even a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, some of it, about maybe 10% of it is listed on my Discogs store, which is called TPOS. So if you want to get a small, slight sampling of what I have, go to Discogs, look up TPOS, TPOS, look up my store, and you'll see a mere thimbleful of what I could conceivably bring to an event such as the Punk Rock Holiday Flea. A lot of good stuff. Um, also, on the bulletin board, I should mention that um, a certain bandmate of mine has gone into the t-shirt business. He has made these lovely, lovely G.G. Allen t-shirts. Let's see if I can get it in the frame. Whoops. The nasty word showed. Sorry, guys, anybody who's got delicate sensibilities. Let me try to censor that. These are genuine, honest-to-God, silk-screened shirts made by a real American craftsman. 
right here in the great Northeast. So if you're the type who wants to wear a G.G. Allen t-shirt or give a G.G. Allen t-shirt to a, a relative, such as your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, maybe you want to just walk up to some innocent stranger somewhere and say, here, take this G.G. Allen t-shirt. I have them. Small, medium, large, extra large. The double XLs are all sold out. But I have the other four fine, funky sizes available. 25 bucks each plus shipping. Hit me up. I will be very happy to sell one or two or more to you, provided you're not a double XL. There's always a catch, isn't there? There's always some kind of catch. Always some weasel words that come into play. And tonight's weasel word is no double XL. All the big boys and the big girls want the Gigi Allen shirts. Go figure. I figured you're I thought your average Gigi fan was a scrawny runt like myself. I clock in at 136 on a good day. Um, so, you know, medium, large, maybe even small, but no, double XL, very popular size for G.G. Allen fans out there. And um, I just adjusted the frame a little bit, so if it gets kind of wonky, that's that was my finger in action. And in fact, I'm going to reach over here to my other monitor, and I'm going to move it up a little bit so I can engage with it. And it looks like I'm actually staring at the camera the whole time and not constantly looking down and looking to the side and looking every which away except at you, the loyal listener and frantic fan of Tent Talks 2. All right, I think I got it. I think I got it. And I'm going to turn down the volume on my cell phone, which acts as a control device for this camera. I was griping and moaning about the sound quality on this a while ago, a few weeks ago, and Mike Lesser said, why don't you get an audio monitor? A valid point and a good question, except for the fact that the audio lags about two seconds behind what I'm actually saying on the monitor. So that would lead to incredible mass confusion, even more than I'm experiencing right now. If you think that Tent Talks Tunes is kind of a hot mess tonight, ha <laughs> ha! You just don't even want to know what would happen if I tried to have an audio monitor going on. It would be positively psychedelic. This would be a 35-pound, 35 35-gallon 35 expanding, contracting jug if I tried to have an audio monitor going on. It wouldn't be pretty. Would not be pretty. All right. Now, there has been... A little bit of mail coming through to P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470, as I'm demonstrating for you right now, very kindly. Anybody who knows, I probably, you know, I probably don't need to conceal the mailing address on this one. I just think it's polite, too. But anybody who knows Jeff Clayton knows he loves his stickers and he loves his Sonny and Cher. So that is a dead giveaway right there. Amy Lynn Myers is chiming in to say that the camera clarity is fabulous and it's going smoothly. Thank you, Amy, for that. I appreciate it very much. I'd like to know that everything is dory hunky and A-OK. So yeah, man, got some mail. I'm wearing some of the mail, actually. This fine, fabulous, funky, fresh, anti-scene hooded sweatshirt which came to me from the unimpeachable president for life himself, Mr. Jeff Clayton. Thanks, boss. I appreciate it. Somebody remarked, man, how come in, during the wintertime I always see you wearing anti-scene shirts? Well, because every single hoodie and sweatshirt I've got has got an anti-scene design on it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm not only fashionable, I'm provocative. People notice these things. It's good, baby. It's good to be noticed. I like it. I like it a lot. And if you want to be noticed... Sporting around town, going to the gas station, going to the grocery store, going to the shopping mall. If you want to be seen in an anti-scene sweat, go to antiscene.com and or anti-scene big cartel, and you can be as well-dressed as I am. Now, as far as the big piece of mail we got here, this is a kind of a thick box of seven-inch singles, you know. When you've been in the biz as long as I have been, you know what's in a box this size, 7 by 7 by one approximately. It really couldn't be anything else other than 7-inch singles. So let's see what they are. This is a cold reveal. Cold reveal. It is 
sealed. I'm going to take the world famous million mile scissors and very deftly open up the package in front of everybody. We're going to find out exactly what's in this box live on Facebook. If you're tuned into my YouTube channel where this is archived, just pretend it's live. Oh, God. Ugh. So much work. I, uh, uh. There we go. The tape has been incised. The flap is open. There's one flap. There's another flap. More flaps. The box is open. The contents are packed between cardboard. There is a comment on it. Mmm, an order from the president. Send me eat more possum cassettes, you sod. EMP, if you're an insider, means eat more possum. Yes, Jeff Clayton, I will send you the eat more possum cassettes. It's going to happen, plus a couple other things I've got to send you. Promesa. One piece of packing cardboard. Another piece of packing cardboard. And wouldn't you know it, the latest product from Anti-Scene Incorporated. This is a good one. I have not seen these yet. This is my first time seeing them, as is yours. Check this out. Anti-Scene. Sloppy Seconds. 7-inch picture disc. Oh my god. Look at that. That is a picture disc, my friends. Yes, you can play it. Yes, it looks really good when you're playing it. And these days, they actually sound pretty good, too. I don't know if I have any of my fellow travelers from the 1970s, maybe some of you fellow, fellow oldsters or even just record collectors in general, remember the first wave of picture disc popularity from like the mid to late 70s, when... Every single picture disc that was marketed had a disclaimer on it saying that the sound quality of the picture disc may not be compatible with that of a regular pressed final album. That was kind of an understatement. Picture discs by and then pretty much sounded lousy. They sounded shite. The technology has advanced quite a bit in the intervening 40-something years, and so I'm, I haven't heard it yet, but I'd say the odds are pretty good. This is going to sound great, because picture discs now sound pretty much as good as regular pressed vinyl. And so, yes, look at that. Fight Like Apes by Anti-Scene. One of my favorite songs to play live by the band I'm in. And Sloppy Seconds. More oldster fellow traveler punk rockers who we are extremely excited to be on a split 7-inch with. So thank Jeff Clayton for sending me these. Thanks, Jeff Clayton, for sending me these. Got quite a few of them here, and of course I'm going to keep a few for myself, but if anybody wants one, let me know. I got them. Just a, a, a simple hint. What a great holiday package to get for your loved ones. A G.G. Allen t-shirt and an anti-scene picture disc 7-inch. Save on shipping. Get them both. A friendly household hint from me, your pal, Malcolm Tent. The guy who loves his one-gallon jug of Danbury tap. <sighs> All right, so what do you say we talk tunes? This week is one of those weeks where I actually had no idea whatsoever. I had no topic, pre no topic prepared beforehand. I had nothing in the tank. I'm winging it. I'm just going as it goes. And it was actually not that difficult because I've been playing a lot of music lately by one of my very favorite artists, somebody who I really love. And by listening to this one guy, it sort of leads into a, a rabbit hole of other fellow travelers with this dude. And I've been trying to remember, <clears throat> you know, it's so weird. I don't know if you people do the same thing. I'm sure you do. If you do, let me know. Post a comment. I have no idea why all of a sudden I got a mad urge to start listening to lots and lots and lots of Warren Zevon. 
it's the darndest thing. This this urge to play a lot of Warren Zevon just came out of nowhere. I don't know what triggered it. It must have been the... Uh, I don't know if I was saying a, a conversation with somebody, or... I just don't know. It might have to do with a conversation I was having with my chick, Chrissy, who's in North Carolina, and she's baking a pie right now. Maybe baking a couple of pies. I think, Chrissy, I was talking to you. And for some strange reason, our conversation reminded me of the time that we were in Tucson, Arizona, driving around, and you played me a version of Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me by a 90s female country rocker. Was it Leanne Rhymes? Chrissy, if you're watching, can you remind me who is it that did the version of Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me that you like so much? I want to say Leanne Rhymes. I, I could very well be wrong. But that, of course, triggered me, and I said, well, if you think that's cool, you should hear the original by Warren Zevon. And Warren Zevon is one of those singers who's got a voice that either you love or you loathe. And I can definitely see why people would have a hard time with Warren Zevon's voice. It's, it's unique. It's idiosyncratic. It is charismatic. It can be downright annoying. I love his voice. I, can, I, can, I can't really take it in huge doses, but I do like his voice. Oh, I see a, a comment from Chrissy. Tracy Clark. Okay. Tracy Clark did a pretty cool version of Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, which led to me saying, hey, well, if you think that was cool, I got to check out Warren Zevon's. And that led to us looking up Linda Ronstadt's version from 1975-ish. And that was my first exposure to Warren Zevon was because my, my father had a copy of the Simple Dreams album by Linda Ronstadt. And she does Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me on that one. So I hadn't heard that one in a very long time. And so we had listened to the Tracy Clark version and then the Warren Zevon version. And then we, we looked up the Linda Ronstadt version. And it was really interesting. We both kind of looked at each other and we were like, that's the version. We, we both sort of sparked immediately that Linda Ronstadt does the version of Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. Better than Warren Zevon's original. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, better than Terry Clark's. So, did I get the name wrong? Did I pronounce Terry Clark wrong? I don't know what's going on. I see the comments, but I can't really see them. These black readers are not as powerful as my trademark purple readers. This is another sacrifice of me trying to get on the air in a timely fashion. The things I do to talk tunes. So anyway, I've been only going to mad Warren Zevon kick lately. I dragged out my copy of the first album of Excitable Boy, and of course, you know, the, the one thing he had that kind of resembled a hit was uh, Werewolves of London, and that is on this album. And then, of course, uh, the live album, Stand in the Fire, which, of course, uh, oh, that's what it is. Terry Clark, not Tracy Clark. Terry Clark comedy of errors here. Terry Clark is the one who did Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. And of course, the live Warren Z on Stand in the Fire. And this led to me going onto my, not onto YouTube, see what a modern guy I'm turning into. No, I went into my collection of videos, in this case, a DVD that I transferred from VHS and commenced to watching a live video of Warren Zevon from 1982 from Passaic, New Jersey on tour for his album called The Envoy. And that's just one of the things I love so much about Warren Zevon. He made an entire album based around an ambassador, basically. You know, it, the title track is about how things are going, going wrong all over the world and the potatoes are about to hit the fan and uh, imminent Holocaust, what do you do? You send out the envoy. And so it's just a song about the envoy going to all these hot spots and smoothing everything out diplomatically. It's, it's a hell of a concept, and it's a great song, too. Um, and watching this video is really something because in 1982, he had, you know, one of those crack 
L.A. session musician bands behind them. Guys who are like totally pro. Guys who can play pretty much anything. Guys who've got all their chops together and all their licks together. And they rock and they're professional and they're effective. And so there are certain moments in this video where those where the guys in the band are like on their stage doing their thing and they look good and they sound good. And then all of a sudden here comes Warren Zevon, either with a guitar or from behind his piano. And you can tell that this dude hadn't has not slept in two or three days and that he could very well be on something very potent that's making his eyes bug out and his pores drip sweat. And he's got this incredible, almost maniacal energy about him, which is in total contrast to the cool, calm, collected members of his band. And it's just such a great juxtaposition because the stuff that he writes about, as I mentioned a second ago, he's writing about an envoy, you know, a guy who is a diplomat. He writes about this really weird, cerebral highly intelligent stuff, but delivers it like a guy who's been up on illicit substances for three nights. You know, it, it's really, it's such a great contrast. That's part of what made Zevon Zevon so great, I think. Ah, got a message from Todd God Jenkins that just popped up. I can't read it. I'll have to minimize it and read it later. Todd, if you're watching, I'll read it later. Promise. So, yeah, Warren Zevon, I mean, love the guy. He also pulled one of the, the classiest moves ever. In the late stages of his career, in the early 21st century, he was not selling a whole lot of records. He was very bummed out about it. He was depressed at the fact that he, you know, he had his one hit. He was probably considered a one-hit wonder, but he's still writing tons of songs, tons of great songs. And then he got a diagnosis of terminal cancer. And he actually said, point blank, he said, you know what? This is the best career move that could have ever happened to me. And he wrote and recorded his willful last album, his last will and testament, The Wind. And all of his records are good. I think every single Warren Zevon record is really good. But this one right here, the one that he wrote consciously and specifically as his last statement on planet Earth... It's got a certain gravitas to it. It's really something that a guy, or any, a guy, a gal, anybody would actually, with a diagnosis of three months to live, decide to record one last album and, and write about it. Heck of a record. And just the kind of thing that a weirdo like Warren Zevon would do. And I've got a story about Warren Zevon, if anybody wants to hear it. it in, in, because today was so rushed and getting together, I'm going to have to go into the next room for one second and grab the prop, okay? Because the prop is critical to the story. So just kind of like, uh, you know, read the flyer for the punk rock flea market, read the flyer for my website, uh, maybe be confused as to why I'm flashing that in front of the screen before I leave. Just pretend I'm there, you know, no big deal. It ain't going to be long because I got the prop and I'm coming right back on camera even as we speak. There we go. Okay, so the year was, if I recall correctly, 1996-ish. 1996 or so. For a while, Dan Barry had a really good rock club called Tuxedo Junction. And Tuxedo Junction booked some, like, top-shelf acts... They had a real good run for almost five years. I mean, everybody from Sonic Youth to P-Funk to Cheap Trick to Buffalo Tom to Ace Freely to Merciful Fate, uh, King Diamond, um, Deicide. I saw so many great bands there for such a little while. And sometime around 1996, Warren Zevon was booked to play Tuxedo Junction. And at the time, Tuxedo Junction was like just a few blocks from where I lived. It was just an easy matter to walk to this venue and see a world-class show and walk back home. And since I was the local record store guy and I helped promote the shows and I would sell tickets to the shows and do stuff like that, I, I had an in. 
I could just show up and say, hi guys, it's me, let me in. So I was not like a giant Warren Zevon fan at the time, but I was like, I knew he was cool. And, um, you know, for free, why not? I'll go, I'll go see almost anybody for free. I went to go see Vanilla Ice for free, kids. Yes, I saw Vanilla Ice and paid zero dollars because he was playing a few blocks away from my house and I could not resist. And it actually ended up being the last show that Tuxedo Junction ever booked. Vanilla Ice playing to an audience of 32 people. How do I know that? I counted them. I sat up in my usual crow's nest in the G DJ booth and I counted every audience member at the Vanilla Ice show, which was, I'm pretty sure, in early 1998. <sighs> I digress. I think I'm going to sneeze. Am I going to sneeze? Hold on. Okay, I'm not going to sneeze. You guys have seen me perform a lot of weird tricks on Tent Talks tunes, but you've never seen me sneeze. And we just avoided that spectacle. Ah. So anyway, Warren Zevon's playing at Tuxedo Junction in Danbury, Connecticut. I've got an in, so I go to see the show, and it was great. It was really, really good. Um, he looked good. He sounded good. He was doing a, a one-man show with, a, you know, acoustic guitar and piano. Played all the hits. Played a bunch of new stuff that I had not heard, including, including this one song called Figurine, which was really awesome. It's, a, it's kind of like a song about being a one-hit wonder, but still having something to say, but nobody wants to hear what you have to say. They want you to be a figurine. Jenny DeSoto from New Jersey has just checked in. Hello, Jenny. How you doing? My new town homegirl is in the house. Everybody give a round of thumbs up and say hello to Jenny. Jenny says, good morning. She knows me well. Anyway, so there I am at Tuxedo Junction digging on the Warrens Yvonne. It's really cool. And um, when the set is over, Warrens Yvonne goes... Off the, he like walks off the stage, sits down at a table on the floor, and starts signing autographs. I'm like, oh wow, cool, cool! I can get a Warren Zevon autograph. Why not? Um, kind of like my presentation tonight. I didn't have anything with me. I you know wasn't expecting that, and I honestly don't remember if they were selling CDs or not. At that time, I was probably such a cheap skate I wouldn't have bought a CD anyway. Um, cause one of the side effects of having a brick and mortar record store, like I did for 21 years was being broke all the time. Um, coupled with my own frugal tendencies, if they did have CDs, I wasn't going to buy one, but I wanted him to sign something. So I looked around, I cast my eyes all over the place and I saw, aha, I know what I can have Warren Zevon sign. I will have him sign a dirty old used Foster's oil can. So why not? It was at the gig. Somebody drank this while he was playing. It kind of makes sense. Whatever. Got to have the guy sign something. So I got in line with all the other punters and, uh, you know, waited my turn. And I got to the table and I said, Warren Zevon, I would like for you to sign this dirty old beat up beer can. And he gave me the look. He didn't quite say the words, you ass. But I could almost hear him thinking it. And I'm like, what's the big deal? I just asked you to sign a beer can, that's all. But he signed it. And he gave it to me. It wasn't until many years later that I learned that that poor guy almost died from alcoholism. The alcohol almost killed him. It was a very, very rough go that he had with the demon rum and whiskey and rye and beer. But, I don't know if you guys can see it, he did it. He signed it. 
And to this day, this autographed Foster's oil can from Warren Zevon sits next to my turntable in my living room. And it is a prized memento. And I have often said that if I ever do meet Warren Zevon again in, in whatever plane of reality, I'll have to give him a firm handshake and a sincere apology. <laughs> But I'd like to think somewhere, some down deep inside his mummified heart, he probably found it was funny, too. I would like to think so. A toast to Warren Zevon and his willingness to sign a dirty old beer can, even though he was right there in the middle of recovery from alcoholism. A good sport. So, of course... Listening to Warren Zevon makes me want to grab some of my other records and CDs from people who are kind of like kindred spirits, who I really like. And that would, of course, include somebody like Randy Newman. Man, I love some Randy Newman. Randy Newman, this dude is beyond jaundiced. Whenever I'm out selling records at events such as the Punk Rock Holiday Flea, and I've got Randy Newman records on my table. I like, I like to put descriptive stickers on the records that I sell because not everybody knows everything about everything. I mean, I certainly don't, but I do know a lot about the records I sell. And I take a lot of joy in being, you know, a little bit didactic with my knowledge. I like to put stickers on the covers, for example, Randy Newman, I'll usually write something that says something like, Randy Newman tells like it is, and it hurts. Or, Randy Newman speaks the truth. It's painful. Something like that. That is the best way I can use to describe Randy Newman. And Randy Newman's another one of those dudes who could be considered a one-hit wonder. He had his hit Short People back in the 1970s. As with many, many other folks, that was my first exposure to Randy Newman. And that, of course, was on the album Little Criminals. I remember there were angry newspaper articles about the song Short People. There were angry short people who didn't like the song. I <laughs> mean, the song Short People really pissed off a lot of short people and tall people. It was kind of like the, uh, the precursor to being canceled. And the thing is, if you've heard more than one Randy Newman song, you would understand that his sense of humor is based a large part on total absurdity and complete irrationality. And a lot of them are told from the perspective of somebody who's probably a little bit loco in El Coco. So you have to look at his stuff through that lens. But if you take a song like Short People... <laughs> and make a 45 RPM single of it and just throw it out into the market, of course it's going to be misconstrued. There's no context. There's no understanding of the greater body of work that it comes from. I mean, for example, the title track. This is such a great Pearl Harbor. You're like, you look at the album. It's Randy Newman's Sail Away. And the guy is looking down pensively. It looks kind of deep. Maybe even kind of romantic, you know. And that was always my first thought. I, it, it was a long. It took me a long time to, to get this album "Sail Away" because oh, Randy Newman "Sail Away." It's a love song, right? Love song. We're gonna sail away, sail away with me. Come sail away. Let's sail away, right? Because it's pop music, and that's what you write about in pop music is, let's sail away. Well, this is a song told from the perspective of a slave trader in Africa, trying to talk some Africans into getting on the slave ship and sailing away to America. And it's told in the most smarmy, condescending... I, you, you gotta hear it to believe it. That's what the title track of this album... It's not a love song. It's not, come on, let's sail away. It's like, hey, you, I think you're really stupid. And I think you should get on this boat and go s sail away to America. And everything will be just fine over there. You won't have to think about anything. You won't have to do anything. You won't have to... I mean, it's just amazing. It is so sardonic and so sarcastic and so intelligent. 
that I, I can't believe a major label actually released it. But they did, mainly because Randy Newman was good friends with the sons of the people who own the label. But that's how it's got to be done sometimes, you know? Man, Randy Newman is one sardonic dude. It really does help to be friends with the son of the guy who owns the record label. It served Randy Newman very well. Randy Newman, of course, is good enough to deserve the success he got. But he definitely benefited from the inn. I remember when this album came out. Randy Newman, Born Again. This was right at the tail end of Kiss Mania. And just as televangelism was starting to really, really make waves in the U.S. of A. Great comment on both. Filled with all kinds of smarmy, painful truths. This has become one of my favorite driving albums. And I hope, you know, I'm not, I'm not paid to say this. I'm not like an influencer. I don't work for Randy Newman or his record company. I'm just talking about what I like. But if Randy Newman, you're out there, or anybody from your record labels out there, and you want to send me some promos, send them to me. I think I'm earning it. I love this album. Bad Love. One of his more recent albums. Just as completely sardonic and callous as anything else he's done. I love driving around to this record. I must be some kind of sicko. But if I am, here's to me. A toast to me. In my mind, Warren Zevon leads to Randy Newman, and Randy Newman must inevitably lead to Harry Nilsson, another tortured genius singer-songwriter, another one of those dudes who was just absolutely brilliant at writing songs, but couldn't really catch on or make a go of it in the so-called real world. Tortured genius. I love this album. The package of it is so perfect. It's such a reflection of, of the dude's psychology. Nilsson Schmilson. This is, I believe, probably his high watermark on the commercial marketplace. He'd had some hits by then. So what does he do? Puts out an album called Nilsson Schmilson. It's a picture of a tired, probably hungover Harry Nilsson in his bathrobe, looking completely depressed. What's he looking at? Looking at the fridge. He's bored. He's got nothing to do except look at the fridge. And he's probably thinking the whole time, Nilsson Schmilson. Probably not a happy guy, but undoubtedly a genius songwriter. Love me some Nilsson. Great, great voice, too. I remember seeing, actually, not only Son of Schmilson... Ah, Larry Mann just made a comment. You're breaking my heart. Yes, that is a Nilsson song. Oh, man. You want to hear a broken heart song? Listen to You're Breaking My Heart by Nilsson. Woo! It even has the F word in it, which just was not done at that time in the record business. You didn't use the F word, but Nilsson did. What a song. This one, too, was also in the cutout bins a lot when I was a kid. The Pussycats record. Nilsson produced by John Lennon. In truth, it's not a very good album. It's, it's got some nuggets, but it's typical of the uh, Lost Weekend L.A. 1975. Nilsson, Lennon, Ringo Starr, Keith Moon, Alice Cooper. These guys basically did nothing but drink, fight, and party 24 hours a day. And then when they were contractually obligated to do so, they would you know, crap out an album because they had to. And this definitely falls in that category. You know, it's got some good stuff on it, but uh, yeah, it's more of a curio than anything else. And I could have had it for 99 cents back in the early 1980s. I think I ended up paying a dollar for it sometime in the 21st century. I got my dollar's worth. 
about a dollar's worth on this one. Mm, 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 mm. But I'll play some Schmilson or some Nilsson, no problem. Yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of like the long, twisted rabbit hole of a story of what I've been listening to for the past little while, and what I like to talk about on uh, Tent Talks Tunes. But there is one more thing. One more thing. Uh, I had a photo, you know, I post on social media, on Instagram and Facebook when I'm going to go on Tent Talks Tunes. And I posted a record that has nothing to do with anything I just talked about during tonight's episode. The photo I posted has nothing to do with anything I talked about. So I'm kind of obligated to talk about it. And that's this record right here. The Woody Woodpecker Talent Show. And one might ask, what has that got to do with anything? Why on earth are you posting or talking about the Woody Woodpecker Talent Show? This actually has bearing on my recent history because I can remember why I'm talking about this album. I can totally remember because the conversation I had that led to this occurred two days ago with my good friend Nick Chalsulo. Nick, from somewhere near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Nick is the guy who promotes the annual Devo fan convention, the devotional out in Cleveland. And you knew that I was going to have to mention Devo at some point during Tent Talks Tunes. You knew it was going to happen. Anyway, me and Nick were talking about um, a project that we're working on, a vinyl project that we're working on for next year's devotional. Remember, you heard it here first. I'm not at liberty to give out details, but I think it's going to be a coinky dink, a corker when it does come out. We were talking, and the conversation turned to the fact that he has an old Victrola 78 RPM record player. And that, of course, immediately you know, made me think about my love of 78s. I've, I have done an episode of Tent Talks Tunes all about 78s. If you go onto my YouTube channel, you'll find it. And I just immediately went back in my mind to when I was a little kid. And this, this actually kind of ties in with the holiday season a little bit. A lot of times for the holidays, me and my family would go over to my grandma and granddad's house. That was kind of like one of the meeting points. We would always go to a relative's house for a holiday, or they would all come over to our house. My favorite was going over to my grandma and granddad's house. I loved their house. It was in Opalaca, Florida. And Opalaca was one of the older neighborhoods in South Florida. It actually dated back to the 1930s and growing up in the kind of neighborhood that I grew up in where nothing was more, nothing was older than like 1969 and very, very little in South Florida is older than that. Anything that had like a trace of history or age to it, you know, or some kind of ancestral feeling to it. I just loved, like, even when I was a really little kid, I always preferred older stuff to newer stuff. Old buildings, old signs, old records, um, old people, even, you know, because they were just cool. There was, they didn't look like, like, Opalaka did not look like the neighborhood I grew up in. And I just really liked that. It just had this feel about it, this history and this depth to it. That's why I love going to England so much in Northern Europe, because there's history that goes back literally thousands of years there. And you can feel it in the air. You can sense it. It's like this sort of magic. And so my first ever brush with that kind of feeling was going to my grandma and granddad's house, because they'd been living there for since the 40s, I believe. And, you know, there wasn't even anything happening anywhere in South Florida in the 40s. So this was like ancient history. This was like the past. And so even at that young age, I really keyed into that. I really connected with it. And 
my grandma and granddad's house was kind of a lot like mine. They had a very neat, orderly house. You know, it was clean, it was organized, but there was always something going on. Like my grandma was always working on stuff. She would, she did all kinds of like, uh, oh, like, uh, what knitting and needlepoint and sewing and she did a lot of cooking she was very crafty so she always had like her craft projects going and her arts and craft projects going there's always like a pile of stuff here and a pile of stuff there it wasn't a mess but there was just always something on a tabletop or in a corner that she was working on and there was always a lot of it i remember that so well and they had one room in the house that used to be my Uncle Tom's bedroom. And that was where all the clutter went. And my house is the exact same way. I've got my one room where all the clutter goes. Everything's, it's not like junk, it's not garbage, it's all stuff I'm working on, but it's works in progress and it's over in that room over there. So it must be a genetic disposition of some sort. So I used to love to go into my old, my uncle's old bedroom where all just this stuff was. So much stuff. Old school books, old magazines, old, um, like, I don't know, regular books. Um, tons of, like, arts and crafts supplies for my grandma's arts and crafts projects. Um, leftover things that my uncle had left behind. And in there were lots and lots of old records. And my mom tells me that when she was a kid, my grandma and granddad had like hundreds of records, all of them 78s, because that's what she listened to at the time. By the time that um, I was making the scene, most of those records were gone, but there were still a few. There were, there's still a few records. I remember specifically one cardboard box that had all the records in it. And one that I remember from the very, very early days of when I was very, very young that I would listen to a lot when I was a little kid. Probably every time I went over to visit my grandma and granddad's house was a record that they had bought for my mom when she was a kid. And that was... Woody Woodpecker's Talent Show. And there's probably a time when I could have recited every word of every skit on this entire album. Don't think I could do it nowadays, but I remember this. And I love the fact that this is literally an album. You know, people talk about a record album. Why is a record album called a record album? Because in the old days of 78s, a record consisted of an album. A lot of times you had, you know, the art, you had a little booklet for the kitty records, and you had the records themselves, which were in an album. So the term has survived over these years, a record album referring to a literal album of records. And this is, this is not the actual copy that my mom had. I found this at a record swap meet a few years ago. I, of course, nabbed it the second I saw it. I'd, I'd like to think that one of my relatives got the one that my mom had, because I've got a pretty fair number of younger cousins, and I have this sort of vision of the Woody Woodpecker album making it from me to my younger cousins and then to their kids. I don't know. But this was definitely triggered by my conversation with Nick and his Victrola and I just, you know, I might listen to this one again tonight. Maybe. Maybe I'll play some Randy Newman, some Harry Nilsson, some Warren Zevon, and some Woody Woodpecker. I think that's it. I think that's my playlist for tonight. I think that's going to be it. And that's why I posted that picture. Because it had to be done. So, yeah, I think that's it. I think I'm done with tent. Talks tunes for this lovely Wednesday night. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If you guys are the type to do holidays, I hope you have a lovely Thanksgiving tomorrow. If you're not the type to do a holiday, I just hope you have a good day in general. I know I fully intend to, I fully plan to. I think that my holiday is going to involve 
pretty much not doing anything. <laughs> it's going to be good. I'm going to enjoy being a lazy slob for one day. I'm going to really, really like that. So thanks everybody for tuning in. I do expect to be back in about 167 hours. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tense saying so long from the Nutmeg State.